Welcome to Stand in the Gap Today with your host, the Honorable Sam Rohrer, President of the American Pastors Network, addressing the most pressing issues impacting our economy, our homes, our churches, our culture, and our daily lives from a biblical and constitutional perspective. Stand in the Gap Today, transforming the culture one heart at a time. Hello and welcome to this Wednesday edition of Stand in the Gap Today. And this is also our bi-monthly focus on Israel and the Middle East and prophecy. You know, you can't talk about Israel in the Middle East without also talking about prophecy. So that's why these are all connected. You know, you realize that we're just a week away from the fourth anniversary, the fourth month of the Hamas terror attack against Israel. Hard to believe, isn't it? And then following that, we know a resultant declaration of war by Israel. And now, day by day, seems a much broadened Middle East war that brings in just another country after another, as we see before us. Now, to this point, diplomacy, the normal approach of those government leaders, have continued to fail. They haven't reached a diplomatic solution. A remarkable deep-seated hatred, though, by the enemies of Israel, I think, is at the bottom of this. They have said they want to wipe Israel from the map. They want a global genocide against all Jews. They've been stated and they restated by, well, Hamas, Palestinians, Hezbollah, Iran, Turkey, and other Arab and Islamic nations. Yet there are few government leaders from the West or the East who appear to understand anything, really, about the roots of this. They don't understand history sufficiently to understand the roots of the conflict and why diplomacy, while repeatedly tried, only fails with recurring war, and now perhaps another imminent and decisive war between Israel and her neighbors about to occur. It's only when a person goes to the Word of God can this Middle East conflict be understood, the roots of the perpetual hatred of Jews by Arabs identified, the cause historically described, and the personalities illustrated, and the ultimate resolve then, which we want to do always, that resolve to be predicted with complete accuracy. You can do that, though, when you go to the Word of God. So today, Bill Solace, founder of Prophecy Depot Ministries, prolific author, prophecy conference speaker, and my recurring guest on matters of Israel, Middle East, and prophecy, is joining me today as we focus on the theme, Arab Hatred of Jews, the Historical Roots and Devastating Resolve. And you'll understand all of those things as we move into the program. Bill, thanks for being with me today. Hey, Sam. It's great to be back on the program. Bill, let me just set the ground and work. And together, we'll do this here in this first segment and then move into further explanation. But as I look back, ever since the Balfour Declaration by the UK in 1917, stating an intent to form a reformed homeland for the Jewish people, to the actual formation of the modern state of Israel in 1948, to this very moment, controversy with periodic military attempts by Israel's Arab members to destroy them. It's been the reality. The October 7th attack, Bill, by Hamas now broadening to include the attention of all the nations of the world, the United Nations, all the nations are condemning one side or the other, they've lined up. But Jerusalem and Israel seems to be increasingly becoming the troublesome stone for all peoples, just as the Bible says. But if you understand the deep-seated hatred, and that is what we want to talk about today. You've written much on it, thought how appropriate to discuss it today. So from a strategic perspective, here's what I'd like you to do here to begin us. Would you describe the foundational problem? We'll explain the roots of it and all that in the next segment, but describe the foundational problem that undergirds and continually fuels conflict in the Middle East. Absolutely. And that's a really important thing to note because, like you said, the world politicians don't understand the deep-seated hatred that has fueled and spawned through the centuries to get us to this climactic point right now between the Arab and Israeli conflict. The present hostility Sam experienced in the Middle East between the Arabs and the Jews can actually be traced to a disposition of hatred that originated almost 4,000 years ago. And at that time, the Lord had made an unconditional covenant the Hebrew patriarch Abraham, and due to the blessings, the rich blessings contained within this covenant, the famous Bible characters of Hagar, Ishmael, Esau, Moab, Ammon, and Amalek, for instance, they coveted the rich content of this covenant. And then these jealous individuals and their descendants who followed hated the Hebrews, the Jews as they are today who are the heirs of this blessed covenant. And throughout time, the neighboring Gentile populations of the region, 
the Philistines, etc., uh, found it advantageous to embrace this hatred, which ultimately has evolved into Islam, which is a religion of violence, essentially licensed to kill the Jews. The jihad is what they would call it. As it's often labeled as presently underway in the Middle East, finds its justification in Islam, but its roots are deep-seated into this long-standing hatred. The Bible calls it, in a couple places, the Hebrew words are olam, iba. It's an ancient hatred, or sometimes translated as a perpetual enmity. And what it is describing in those two words in the Hebrew is it's a condition of hatred stemming back long ago in ancient times that became more violent as time went on. And it's hatred that will not end and is cancerous and it ultimately needs to be surgically or we'll say militarily, not diplomatically, removed. It, these, these words show up in two places. Uh, Ezekiel 35.5 says, because you, referring to the Edomites who have ethnical representation into the Palestinians today, because you have had an ancient hatred, al and have shed the blood of the children of Israel by the power of the sword at the time of their calamity when their iniquity came to an end, meaning it's gone through history until even presently. See, this is where it originated with the Esau's descendants, the Edomites. Esau was Jacob's twin brother. We'll get into that more into the program. They originated it. You have had this ancient hatred. And like I said, the Gentile nations around there and populations embraced it because it's more advantageous to their needs. And so the next time it shows up, Ezekiel 25, 15, it was spawned by the Edomites, but it was embraced by the Philistines. And it says, thus says the Lord God, because the Philistines dealt vengefully and took vengeance with a special heart to destroy because of the Olamibah, the ancient hatred. In other words, it existed and they embraced it. So okay, that's what okay, you're dealing with. Okay, okay, Bill, we're just about out of time. You're identifying a couple things. It seems to me there's an historical, racial, a family feud component. You mentioned a couple of sons of Abraham, and then we're going to get into Isaac. There's a religious component behind all of that. You talked about Islam and jihad feeding into it. There's obviously a response to how people responded to God's plan and promise to Abraham. If you put all those together and look at them, which of those do you think is the most fundamental driver of the hatred that exists between Arabs towards the Jews? Well, ultimately, it's a religious, spiritual situation. You know, Satan does not want the Abrahamic covenant, which was promised to Abraham 4,000 years ago, unconditional covenant, which inherently is for the redemption of man, calling for the second coming of Christ to return, to set up his kingdom. Uh, he doesn't want that. And we know since time back to Pharaoh, uh, Haman of the Persians, the babes of Bethlehem being killed, to Hitler. Uh, to the present conflict in the Middle East, Satan is feeling that. We're told in 1 John 5, 19, the whole world is under the sway. Okay, Otherwise, just hold that. We're out of time, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, our theme today, Bill Solace is with me. Our theme is Arab hatred of Jews, the historical roots, and the devastating resolve. When we come back, we're going to get into the cause, Abrahamic covenant, where it started, and the things that unfolded from that. This is our bi-monthly emphasis on Israel, the Middle East, and prophecy. And my special guest today is Bill Solace. He's the founder of Prophecy Depot Ministries. Has a website, lots of information, very, very good. Prophecydepot.com. Prophecydepot.com. All right. We're talking about the Middle East. Does it seem like there's just no political resolve possible? Well, it certainly hasn't seen one so far, have we? But there's a reason for that. You know, every time I or my wife, Ruth Ann, and I have gone to Israel, and any of you who have gone there, you've probably heard the same thing. You ask them a question, and they say, well, you know, in Israel, everything's complicated, right? Have you been there? You've heard that, I am sure. Well, the fact is that everything is complicated, but there's a reason for that. And my sense is because people, modern Jews, the Jews in Israel, the majority are there in unbelief, as the Bible says, modern Jews and Gentiles, everybody else that's not a Jew, all alike simply refuse to, well, agree with God's plan for the Middle East and his promise for a people, the Jews, a nation, Israel, and a capital city called Jerusalem. That's it. Now, one day, though, soon, I'm going to say that complicated will be made simple, and it's going to be very clear. And it's going to be enforced with a divine rod of iron following Christ's return when Jesus Christ 
sets up his physical and literal reign as king of Israel. Frankly, king of the world, too. And it'll be there in the capital city of Jerusalem, and it will follow on the heels of the second coming of Christ. But none of us who fear God and living today should be confused like the rest of the world as to what God's plan is, and therefore not communicate the truth. So that's the purpose for today's program. So Bill, in an article you just wrote entitled, Why Arabs Hate Jews, you start the first paragraph with these words, quote, present Middle East hostilities between the Arabs and Jews can be traced to a disposition of hatred originating almost 4,000 years ago, end quote. And you alluded to it back in the first segment. Explain, what was it that happened 4,000 years ago that, I'm going to say, launched the hatred that has now only grown to include not just a few people, but billions? Well, absolutely. I think that's important because this is where the roots of this whole Mideast conflict originate. Uh, God made an unconditional promise to the patriarch Abraham, he promised six um, incredible blessings. We, time permitting, we can go through what, what they were and where we can find them. But ultimately, they lead toward the redemption of man. It was God's plan of redemption of man on through Abraham and his, his seed, which we have to trace who is, is his real seed. Of course, the Arabs believe that was Ishmael, which was his first son. But, of course, we realize from the Bible it's actually his, uh, Jacob, his second son. But what happened, because of the rich content of this covenant and these blessings, you had these family feuds start to develop. Uh, you find out that Sarah, the, the mothers were feuding Sarah, Abraham's true wife, versus Hagar, his con concubine. You find that in Genesis 16 and 21. Then you had the sons, Isaac and Ishmael, Genesis 16, 17, and Genesis 21. You'll find it there. Then there were the twin brothers that came down through Abraham, the Abraham's grandsons. Jacob and Esau, that's in Genesis 25 through 28 and 32 through 33. Then it even keeps going further down the, the line to the cousins, Israelites versus the Ammonites and Moabites. Now, the Ammonites and Moabites would be northern Jordan and southern and central Jordan. And there's all kinds of verses with that. I put all this stuff in my Psalm 83 book, The Missing Prophecy Revealed, uh, available on my website, prophecydepot.com. Then ultimately it goes down, and this is where it really sort of peaks, the Hebrews versus the Amalekites, the great grandkids of uh, Abraham, and that's in Numbers 14 and Judges 3. So they started to covenant, they started to covet the rich contents of the covenant. They felt they were deserving of them, all these nemesis, but in reality they they were wrong. And of course, and that has fueled the conflict since time immemorial that we're facing right now, head head face forward in the Middle East. All right. So it started with Abrahamic covenant. And I think for the purpose of, let's go do that right now, if you can. You said there were six component pieces of the Abrahamic covenant. And I think it is interesting, as you lay it out, that obviously it was Abraham, the line went to Isaac, and then it went to Jacob. These other sons got involved in, as you said, there were promises. They wanted the promises, but they didn't want to do the rest of what God said. So what were the six promises that they wanted. Delineate those six, if you could, the part of the Abrahamic covenant. Exactly. They, they should have supported the true heirs of the content of the Blessed Covenant, but it, they were adversarial throughout time. The, the promises were in Genesis 12, 1 and 2. We talk about Abraham is going to become a great nation with a great name. We're told in Genesis 13, through 13, 15 and Genesis 22 and elsewhere that he would have descendants forever. We're told that those descendants would be you know, as, as many as the stars in the sky and the sand on the sea. Therefore, they need a lot of land to live upon. That's where you get the chosen people get the promised land. We're told in Genesis 15, 18, that that land will stretch from the river of Egypt, river, the great river in Egypt, probably the Nile, to the Euphrates, which, of course, is through modern-day Iraq and Syria. They're going to get that. Someday, they're going to get all of it in the Messianic Kingdom. Uh, then we're told the, the promise that you need the chosen people on a promised land, you're going to need an eternal king to rule over them. And Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were all told that in their seed, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And we find out in Second Samuel 7, verses 12 through 13, that that seed would come from the kingdom of David. That's part of the Davidic covenant and amplification 
of the Abrahamic covenant, and we find out in several verses in the New Testament who that eternal king is, the seed of David, in John 7, 42, Romans 1, 3, and 2 Timothy 2, 8, that the seed is Jesus Christ. Uh, Luke 1, 32, 33 says, He will be great, even then we call the Son of the Highest. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign upon the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. And the Messiah will come, and he will fulfill that in the Messianic kingdom. But if you can have a chosen people with a promised land with an eternal king, you need to have a eternal law. We find that the final amplification of the Abrahamic covenant is the eternal law. In Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 32, Behold, the days are coming, the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And the whole house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers the day that they took them out of the land of Egypt, but my new covenant, which they broke, my new covenant I will make with the house of Israel in those days, says the Lord. Jeremiah 31, verse 33, I'll put my law in their minds, and I'll write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And we find out how he's going to do that, and that's what we're grafted into as believers into the Savior of covenant, through the new covenant, is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16, and 17, 14, verses 16 through 17, and John 14, verses 26, tell us that the Holy Spirit is going to indwell us. He's going to be our helper. And from that vantage point internally, this is not laser surgery. He's going to indwell us. He's going to write God's law upon our minds and upon our hearts. And for believers right now, that's what's transpiring. Ultimately, this will be fulfilled in the the Jews, too, who come to get saved through Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation period in Armageddon. All right, excellent. So that, that's the, the roots of that whole thing. Okay, so those are the thing. Great nation, great name, dependence, descendants forever, a promised land to go with it, an eternal king, we have an eternal law. All right, all of these things come. So let's go back now, back to Abraham. The covenant, the promise had been given to Abraham by God. He had then two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Okay, let's start here. How did these two sons respond? Because that's where problems began. And then how did God respond to their response? Well, uh, we'll get to that real quick. I know we don't have much time in this segment. Uh, it starts with the mothers, really. Uh, Sarah initially was barren and couldn't have a child. So they, it was cultural and acceptable at that time that you could, uh, that Abraham could mate with his concubine, which would be Hagar. And it was, I mean, it was, basically we would say that it would be sinful, but it was actually accepted at that time. And so Sarah, Hagar births Ishmael and becomes thinking, I'm the queen bee. I, my son should get these covenant inheritances. But we find out the conflict begins in Genesis chapter 16, where Sarah realized that Hagar actually started to despise her because now she was had uh, the son of Abraham. And so, ultimately, Abraham says to Sarah, okay, tell her what we should do. Sarah tells Hagar she's got to leave. Hagar leaves and with her son Ishmael and, and ultimately finds out that uh, Ishmael, when he's born, also starts to get the same attitude. And they, they pick it up because, ultimately, Sarah become, gives birth to Isaac at an old age. And uh, then they realize that Isaac is actually the blessed heir of the covenant. So this rivalry is now perpetuated on through from Hagar to Ishmael. And they actually uh, get sent out into the wilderness. We find out in Genesis chapter 25, the angel of the Lord says to Hagar, listen, you're gonna, he's going to have 12 sons, but he's going to be a wild donkey. And the 12 sons have 12 tribes. And those 12 tribes uh, ultimately become the sort of the nucleus out of Saudi Arabia, from the ancient Arabia area that started really spawning that whole hatred throughout the whole Middle East. Ladies and gentlemen, so it starts there. So the feud, the family feud, put it that way, as the root of the Arab hatred of the Jews goes back 4,000 years. Comes right off of the Abrahamic covenant. God promised to Abraham the six things we went over. All right, here come the sons. All right, now you have conflict beginning right at generation one. All right, now when we come back, we're going to continue because it didn't stop there. And well, it all continues from there and we'll build on to that because all of that has only grown since 4,000 years ago. So that's why I'm saying now, a lot more people, a lot more nations. So while in the end, the Middle East conflict, which we're discussing today, has a very, very clear family feud component 
and we're talking about that now, that goes all the way back to 4,000 years, Abrahamic covenant. There is even a more fundamental component, I would say, of a rejection, as we've talked about. The fundamental rejection is a rejection of God's plan of redemption. It is a spiritual issue. Genesis 3.15, God telegraphed after the fall that he had a plan of redemption in place. Actually, prophetically talked about even the crucifixion in that verse and throughout the Old Testament. Then it was all about the coming of God's plan of redemption, Jesus Christ, who God determined was going to come through the special people called Israel. And he had to start with somebody, so he went to Abraham. And he gave him promises and said, look, this is what's going to happen. Now, we're 6,000 years away from that point, but everything that God told Abraham is true. Everything he said that would happen to this point has happened. Everything he said will happen, yet to happen, is going to happen. God's plan of redemption is not done yet. We're still in the process, but we're 6,000 years down the road. So whether it was the conflict and the choices between the sons of Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael, or Isaac's sons, Jacob and Esau, or their sons, and how things worked out, from each of them came peoples and nations. And to each, depending on their relationship to the God of Abraham and God's promises, they experienced specific interactions and pronouncements of blessings and judgments by God, which continue to this day, with many of these yet to be fulfilled. But it goes to the heart of what we're talking about the hatred. All right, Bill, in the last segment, you build out a little bit the response of Isaac and Ishmael to God's promise to their father, Abraham. And once you build out, just enter a little bit more, God's response. Did he promise anything in there to them as a result of the response? But then following that, go next to Isaac's sons, Jacob and Esau, and their response to God's promise to their grandfather Abraham, and then how God responded to that, because that really laid the foundation from where things now sit. Right. So let's pick it up on the, I call it the tale of the twins, the fate of two nations. And this goes back to a prophecy in Genesis 25, verses 23, given to Rachel, who was pregnant, and she had two nations. The prophecy goes, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other. And the older shall serve the younger. Now, that was unusual. Normally, the older was the, the heir to the birthrights of those families back then. But this is a change of fate here. Ultimately, we find out that's Esau and Jacob. Now, uh, we find out in Genesis chapter 32, verses 28, regarding Jacob, it says, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but we're going to call you Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. So he fathered the, the Jewish people, per se. Now we find out Esau, on the flip side, uh, settled in southern Jordan in the Edomite area, and he fathered the Edomites, we're told in Genesis chapter 36, several places, verses 1 and 9. Uh, this is the genealogy of Esau, the father of the Edomites in southern Jordan. Now what happened was ultimately through a process of events, we're told in Genesis 27, verses 41, that Esau actually comes to hate his twin brother, Esau, and says, I will kill my brother Jacob. Now, how that happened, we find the story. Now, Esau was a hunter. He was a man's man, per se. And in Genesis 25, verses 29 through 34, Esau was out hunting, and he was very hungry. He comes back. Now, Jacob had made this, cooked this stew, and Esau says, hey, I'm very hungry. Feed me your red stew. Edom actually means red. I'm weary, therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, well, some of your birthright, being the first son, remember the heir to the, the covenant, some of your birthright, and I'll give you some of my stew. And Esau goes, well, listen, I'm about to die. What do I care about my birthright? Now, the birthright, this is a critical statement, is the, the plan of redemption for man. Why do I care about the plan of redemption for man? So then Jacob said, swear to me on this day, and Esau did, and, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob said, Esau ate this stew, and Esau ate this stew. But we're told in the last verse 34, Genesis 25, 34, thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, the Hebrew word is bizarre, and that's important to note that, because we find out that, that, that from that very instant on, he started to hate Jacob when he realized what he had done. And ultimately, uh, we see that one of the first evidences of this 
a little bit later when the Hebrews are coming out with Moses, trying to get through back into the land of promise, the land of milk and honey of Canaan, in Numbers 20, verses 21, chapter 20, verses 20 and 21. They're trying to get through the Edom territory, and the king of Edom says, you shall not pass through here. So Edom came out against the Hebrews with many men and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage to his territory. So Israel turned away from him. So we see that this started to be spawned already. And what ultimately the prophecies that are about to find fulfillment, in my estimation, dealing with this Esau's hatred is perpetuated through the centuries, despising his birthright. We're told in two places, Jeremiah 49, verses 15, it says, For indeed I will make you Edom which had representation in the Palestinians today. I will make you small among nations, which they are. They can't even get a nation. Among all the Arabs, they don't have a state. They want one, but they're not going to get one. Because they're going to be made small among the nations. They already are. And you will be despised, the Hebrew word Basa, among men. And then it repeats this in Obadiah verses Chapter 1, verse 2. Behold, I will make you small among the nations, and you will be greatly despised, Basah. So it's, it's a turnaround. In other words, Esau despised the plan of redemption for man. These Palestinians are perpetuating that. They, they, they do not have any reconciliation, no following of God or the Bible and his plan of redemption. They want to kill the Jews. They want to stop that. And ultimately, they are going to be made small among the nations for that, and they will be greatly despised. And ultimately, when they... Arabs who are supporting them, and they'll go to the final war and want to destroy the nation of Israel. We find that in Psalm 83 and elsewhere. Uh, when they realize that's a bitter mistake because they'll be defeated soundly by the Israeli defense forces, uh, they're gonna, those Palestinians, their whole plight is going to be greatly despised. They're small among the nations, and they're about to be greatly despised among men. All right, so let's do this in the balance of this segment. You've identified that there were peoples and nations that came from Ishmael, right, directly as a son of Abraham. I'd like you to identify those nations that are currently in the news. And then I'd like you to go to, again, and call out the descendants of Esau that are the ones who despised, really greatly despised, the birth of God's plan of redemption and are the most vocal right now opposition to Israel. So the nations that represent Ishmael's descendants and then the nations that represent Esau's descendants. Okay, we'll start with Ishmael. Um, of course, they, they were the, the ones deep-seated before even Esau was born. Uh, I told you the story where the angel of the Lord says to Hagar in the wilderness, you're going to have a son. And we're to pick that up in Genesis chapter 16, verses 11. The angel of the Lord says to you, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly. It's speaking about her son, Hagar's son. So not be counted, they will be not be counted for multitude. Well, anyway, so it says, and the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with a child. And you shall bear a son. You will call him Ishmael, which was, what well, was that, a lucky guess? No, God knows the end from the beginning. He knew what the name child would be named. He knew it would be a male. Because the Lord has heard your affliction. But he will be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of his brethren. So, you know, not a good prophecy, but for some house, because she realized he was going to be have a multitude that she she was you know, kind, of, kind of happy about that. We pick it up in Genesis chapter 25, and we get the whole list of his 12 sons. I'm not, I'm not going to read them off to you, but we're told in Genesis 25 verse 18 where they dwelt. They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. So when we put that on an ancient map of modern-day equivalents, you're looking east of Egypt, going a little bit northern towards the Gaza area, pretty much all the way through today, which is Saudi Arabia. He was the father of the Arabs, we're told. Ishmael was. And pretty much he covered ancient Arabia, which is now pretty much modern-day southern Arabia. So they're a very big player, of course, in the Middle East. Uh, they are also involved under the banner of Hagar, excuse me, of Ishmael and Ishmaelites in Psalm 83, verse 6, in the final Arab War of Psalm 83. Uh, so they're a, a huge player inside the end times. And that's where they they are, you know, they, they spawn their descendants, and they represent Saudi Arabia. Right. So the so the biggest do they include Egypt? 
No, not really. Egypt, however, is included in Psalm 83 under the vague okay. banner. So, so, of the so when we think of Ishmael's descendants, if you think Saudi Arabia and the other smaller Arab nations that are around that larger area of Arabia, those would be primarily the descendants of Ishmael. Yeah. Okay. And when we talk about Esau... And All right. Well, we're going to be out, we're out of time here right now. When we come back in the next segment, Bill... I'd like you to just give a quick delineation of those nations that are currently in the news that come directly out of Esau. And then we'll go into, ladies and gentlemen, how this whole thing will be resolved. And again, the point being, just to tell you right up front, it's not going to be resolved by diplomacy. There is actually something else it's called war. But that's not my words. That's what scripture says. And Bill will delineate that when we talk in the next segment. Bill, just before we get into the final resolve here, if you could quickly identify the nations that are currently in the news that are prominent in regard to hatred to Israel that come from the line of Esau. Absolutely. Uh, you've got Esau basically has settled his descendants in southern Jordan. However, through a series of waves of migration, they made their way into Israel proper. 586 B.C., the Edomites started to migrate into Hebron when the Babylonians conquered the Jews. Ultimately, uh, they became called the Idumeans in Greek. We find out in 3, 312 B.C. they uh, were defeated in a conflict with the Seleucid king Antigonus. So we find that they're already rooted from southern Jordan in both places into e the central city of Hebron, in modern-day Israel, in 70 AD, we find they even fought against with the Jews against the Roman Empire. At that time, Caesar freed 40,000 Idumeans to keep their ethnicity intact, and they went back into the Hebron area. We find out also in 135 BC at the Bar Kokhba revolt, the Idumeans fought from the vantage point of Hebron at that point too. So we realize that the Palestinians today have ethnical representation from the Edomite descendantry. Palestinians of the West Bank, Palestinians in the Gaza. However, in the Gaza, you also had ancient Philistines, who they embraced that ancient hatred we read in Ezekiel 25:15. Uh, then you go on forward and you realize that the cousins, the Moabites and Ammonites, we talked about this, of the Israelites, hated the Jews as well. That would be Central Jordan and Northern Jordan. So we got all of Jordan involved. And although they a, got a fragile peace treaty with Israel, that peace treaty will be voided out according to Bible prophecies. And they will be in a war and they will be defeated soundly in Jeremiah chapter 42 and 40, 49 verse 2 rather, and elsewhere. Then you also have, we talked about other people embracing that hatred. All these countries show up as an inner ring of countries sharing common borders with Israel. In Psalm 83 verses 6 to 8, you have the Egyptians under the banner of the Hagarines. You have Assyria, which at that time when this was written, this prophecy, encompassed Syria and Iraq. And of course we see that Syria is still at war with Israel, as is Shia militias inside of Iraq. Uh, then you have the inhabitants of Tyre, that's where Hezbollah is. So we, we see the players on the scene right now hate Israel. Uh, fragile peace treaties exist with Egypt and Jordan, they're going to go away according to prophecies. And ultimately there will be a final conflict that seems to climax in Zechariah chapter 12, verses 2 and 6, where it says they're going to lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem, the surrounding peoples, the countries we're talking about. We're told in Zechariah 12, verses 6, that ultimately the captains of Judah, the Israeli defense forces, will be uh, like a fiery torch, and they will burn the surrounding peoples like sheaves. They'll devour them like sheaves on the left hand and the right hand. And ultimately, and we're told in the final conclusion the prognosis of the Palestinians. Now, not all Palestinians are of my descent, but most of them are. And it says in Obadiah 118 that the house of Jacob, remember Esau's twin brother, shall be of fire, and the house of Joseph of flame, that's the Israeli defense forces. But the house of Esau, the Palestinians, shall be stubble, and no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau. Why? Because for the Lord has spoken. Obadiah 1.18, they will be made small among the nations and despised among men. All right, so what you're laying out, okay, is uh, the nations that we are seeing in the news, all of them have their roots that go back either to 
coming off of Ishmael, or coming off of Esau, who despised the birthright, which means that he turned his back on God's plan of redemption, and God's plan of redemption then went, it was with Jacob, became Israel, and then everything else has now flowed from that. So I want you to build out just a little bit here in that, uh, again, we're saying diplomacy doesn't work. We have the basis of hatred. It's ultimately, as you said, we're making clear, it's a spiritual rejection of God's plan of redemption. And therefore, because the promise of God's plan of redemption through Jesus Christ, ultimately his return, goes to the Jews, the Jews are therefore hated, and everything else that's happening there in the land. Throw them out of the land, destroy the Jews completely. All of that comes from this, a family feud, a rejection of God's plan of redemption. But here it is, 6,000 years down the road. Why, Bill, uh, with all of this history, uh, do you think that war, again, build it out, why war has to be the ultimate conclusion uh, to the fixing of, of this thing? I mean, what Scripture says, again, build out Psalm 83 and what's coming next, but what is it about war, and you said almost like surgically extract, I think you used that word early in your program, why, why, why is that? And anyways, lay that out. Yeah, well, you know, typically, historically, when diplomacy fails, wars begin. You know, peace is not always accomplished diplomatically, nor has it been the primary substance throughout time immemorial. Uh, diplomacy is failing. It's going to fail. We're already seeing wars going, and they're probably going to escalate into prophetic fulfillments of things in the Middle East. Uh, ultimately, the ancient hatred we talked about in the early segment, the Olam Ba. It grows worse throughout time. Now it's embraced in Islam, which is no friendly religion to the Jews or the Christians. I can give you a couple quotes on that in a second. And ultimately, it becomes cancerous. And the only way you can remove it is to remove it surgically, or in this case, militarily. And there's no shortage of biblical prophecies. We've discussed a lot of them on your shows in the past, in my Psalm 83 book as well that show the Israeli Defense Forces taking to task the very populations we're talking about uh, that have spawned and embraced this ancient hatred throughout the region from time immemorial. And these Israeli Defense Forces exist in fulfillment of prophecy. We just read over Diah 118, House of Jacob, a, flame, a fire, J Joseph Flame. Um, they're going to win a war. They have to win a war. It's an existential threat. They've got to fight off their enemies so that they can dwell securely. Ultimately, when they can dwell securely, you're going to see that the Ezekiel 38 prophecy is going to happen. And God's going to use that prophecy to make his name, holy name known in the midst of his people, Israel, the chosen people. That's in Ezekiel 39, verse 7. The Arabs are trying to stop that. They don't realize that they're standing in the way of God's redemptive plan and letting the world know he's the holy God of the Bible. Um, his name is holy. But they are worshiping Allah. They, Islam has taken over that hatred. We're told in Surah 471, 171 of the Quran, so believe in Allah and his apostles. Say not Trinity, desist, it will be better for you, for all is only one. Good with him, he is above having a son. We're told also elsewhere, in Surah 4, 157 through 158, Islam rejects the deity of Christ. Islam rejects his death on the cross. You know, they, they need to be worshipping the God of the Bible. They need to be saved through Jesus Christ, but they are worshipping Allah. And I just read some quotes that they are opposed to Christianity and Jesus Christ. And ultimately, for that, they have to be surgically removed militarily. And that's what the Bible says will happen. And, God is long-suffering, and he wishes that would not have had to happen, but he realizes that is what it's going to take. All right. And, Bill, we're just about out of time. So, ladies and gentlemen, just if you're thinking about this, as believers, we pray that all those who are enemies of Christ, the Arabs have a history. Um, Islamic teaching teaches kill Christians and kill the Jews. But isn't and God's mercy a wonderful thing? There are so many of those who are Islamic who are coming to Christ. Palestinians can be saved, and there are many. Um, we need to pray for that, but time is running out, really, for all of that as we see uh, God's prophetic plan moving and bringing us to a point where right now conflict 
very unlikely, very, very unlikely that backs up from here, but moves freely because God's plan is being worked out. But there's a reason for it. It's God's plan of redemption. So my challenge to you is, are you on board with God's plan? Have you agreed with God's plan of redemption, faith in Jesus Christ? I hope that you have. And then if we have that settled, understanding all that seems to be confusing tends to roll out. Bill Solis, my guest today, website prophecydepot.com. Much information on what we talked about today and a whole lot more you can find there and then on our website, standinthegapradio.com. 